is one of my favorite techniques, perfections. I learned about it, I would probably say some 20 years ago, uh, initially from Robert Zoller and his course. And I am uh, looking forward to sharing it with you. So my goal is to talk with you about well, what are perfections? Sounds like a, you know, a weird word and it's always auto-corrected by phones as protections, but it's perfections. And so I will explain more about that. How do they work? How do they work with other predictive systems, which is important because as its history, it was actually used in tandem with like solar returns in other what we'll call time lore techniques. And then obviously uh, I will wanna talk about, and I will talk about some examples so that you can start to apply some of what I, I, I share. So introducing time lore techniques, there are various systems from the East that talk about planets ruling particular time frames in your life. Now I'm being a bit cheeky here, maybe even I dare say a bit corny. I know I saw Janelle Belgrave here, Nicholas Palomonacos, my good friends be like, oh, that's corny, Sam. And of course, that's a joke about the TARDIS um, right there in terms of Doctor Who. But we're talking about the general sense of time lords. And specifically, when I say time lords, again, I'm talking about where a planet has a designated time frame or rulership over that particular area of your life. And this is what perfection is. Um, we'll talk about that next week. I missed that. But there's some other things um, that one can talk about in terms of perfections or time lords. There are Fedaria. Those of you who have studied Vedic astrology, you know about the Dasha system. There uh, also is another time lord technique, which is called zodiacal releasing. So there are various techniques one can use in figuring out which planet is in charge of my life at this particular time at say 45, at 54, at 12, things like that. So what are perfections? Let's start there. Mainly introduced by Hellenistic astrologers like Manilius, Valens, Ptolemy, Firmicus. These are um, mainly uh, late millennium or last millennium um, or from the BC and then first century AD astrologers. And they espoused an idea of what we would call now perfection, but it was kind of a going forth, a going away, a releasing. So when you see the idea of perfection, it comes from Latin perfectio, which is again, a going away, a setting out. So we're starting from a particular point and moving forward. So we're starting from, let's say your ascendant, if you know your birth time and going forward through the chart. We could also start or perfect from the sun. We could perfect from the moon. We could perfect from the part or lot of fortune. Your chart represents the seed of your act self-actualization or the manifesting of your nature. So one of the things that I love about this system is it operates with the idea of using your chart as the starting point for seeing how your life unfolds, unfurls, like a flower in terms of manifesting more the depth of dimension that's within your soul, within your body, within your spirit, within yourself. Now, one thing that is a natural question that, okay, if you're going around the wheel or your chart, doesn't that mean that you're living your life on repeat? No, we're going to talk more about that. But what I can say succinctly is that it will not be about living your life on repeat. So what I want to do right quick uh, is give you at least an introduction from a traditional slash classical point of view on how we look at the houses of a chart. Because key to understanding perfection, especially if we're talking about perfecting from the ascendant, from the starting point, or what you see here called the helm, is understanding what the houses are about. So the houses are divisions of space as intersection points between what we call the ecliptic, the imaginary orbit of the sun around the earth, and then the horizon, and then the intersection with the zenith, um, the MCIC, the prime vertical by which we can understand 
by the intersection of these particular points, what is rising in your chart, where the midheaven is, what's called there at the top of the sky, and the way in which we might find as a parallel to what the midheaven is, is like noon, being at high noon, whether that's literal or it's more like 1258. However you want to look at it, it's when the sun is supposedly at the highest point in the sky. Now that's technically, if we're talking about the astronomy of it, that's not exactly the zenith, depending where you are in the world, but it's an analog to the zenith toward that highest point. So these particular houses, 12 divisions of this space, of time and space, we should say, uh, are ways by which we can understand what themes, what issues you may be dealing with during a perfection. So for instance, if you are 48 years old, you are in a first house perfection year. You might say like, well, I don't know when I was born. We're gonna talk about that. But if you know when you were born, then I'm going to explain more about how perfection works in a second, but the issues related to self, body, character, appearance will be highlighted. Then subsequently looking at it for the second house as these particular things. And I do want to say first off, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, so even though you may say only see only finances, possessions, income, these are the main things that may constitute related to the second house. And I'm looking at it through what we call a traditional, medieval, Hellenistic, classical lens. In the modern sense, there are, of course, other significations given. One example I might give is this opposite house. So death, inheritance, assets of others, other people's money is also the extension. So some modern astrologers also may assign sex as related to the egg house but you will see that it's also listed here. I'm not gonna get in that debate. We don't have time for that. We can have a whole other lecture, a whole other panel on that discussion, but the classical models of looking at the houses have some of these main designations. I've also supplied some additional ones of understanding, let's say third house related to those things that you see, religion and spirituality, um, you might see ninth house here. I'm going to go to the opposite end. Long journeys, travel, foreign lands, religion. Um, one thing that may surprise you in the classical mindset, it was more omens, dreams, divination. Many more contemporary astrologers will talk about uh, for dreams, the 12th house, but it was classically the ninth house. I do want to point out a few things because I'm not going to read this whole list. I have a whole other lecture that I can do and have done on the houses. But again, we don't have time, but I did want to touch on them, especially for anyone who is not familiar with the concept of the houses or anything at all. And the houses are key to understanding perfection. So you can read through and kind of get a sense of it, even though you may not fully grasp everything, but hopefully by the end of this lecture, some things kind of string along for those who are more familiar with these concepts, you probably do know them. What I do want to draw your attention to that might be a strange concept is that you see for the sixth house, the eighth house, and then the twelfth house, even though it's kind of cut off there, it's a verse from the ascendant. What that means is that these houses have a position in relation to dun, 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 the first house, eighth, sixth, twelfth, where it, the house, the first house can't be adequately seen. It represents blind spots. So if you drive or even like you walk, there are certain ways and certain, you know, things that are not gonna be completely visible. So when you're driving, just to give the illustration, what may happen is that you may be able to see in your rear view mirror, what is kind of behind you. You can see in your passenger view window or your driver's side, something to the side, but in order to kind of really know what is fully happening, you have to look. So you can't just rely on your mirrors. There's an aversion that you have. There's a blind spot. That's what these houses represent. These houses, 6th, 8th, 12th, are often known as the bad houses, the troubling houses, the disturbing houses, you know, in terms of astrology. But that's because they deal with the things that reflect our blind spots. So I just wanted to explain that, particularly because you see like a verse from Ascendant, my son is in the 8th house. 
Does that mean I messed up? Nope. It doesn't mean that. And it means that some of these issues, whether you're going through an eighth house perfection or your, your son is in the eighth house, as I mentioned, you may be dealing with fear, anxiety, the lack of control, um, or you may subsist off your partner's money. Now, you may notice, like, I skipped death. Okay, so you have the son in the eighth house. It doesn't mean, girl, you're going to die. It doesn't mean that you're going to die in the eighth house perfection. I mean, you are, we all are going to die at some point. But people fear, like, when I go through my eighth house perfection year, am I going to die? Well, you know, especially if you're like 48, you've been through maybe four of them already. So chances are you're not going to die that time. But it could happen. So I don't want you to think when you see these particular things, all these things are going to happen. I'm going to be dealing with small animals and slaves and all these other things in the sixth house year. That's not what we're talking about. There's some things that may become more significant and we'll flesh, try to flesh some of those things out as we go through. But let me start off also or continue with fleshing out how do we do perfection? So I'm going to show you two graphs that may help you grasp the idea. One thing I think will help is that we're talking about a temporary ascendant for each year of your life, which means by virtue of you having a temporary ascendant, let's say, you know, you're an Aries rising. So Aries is on the helm for your, your first house. And then the second house, that means you have Taurus and Gemini and so on. If you're in a first house perfection year, which is here, the ascendant, and I'll explain the zero in a second, that means the Lord of your year, the perfection Lord, the time Lord is Mars because Mars is the ruler of Aries. So one thing I also didn't show, I'm sorry, is that you may need to know what planets rule which particular signs. So I'll just say them very quickly and I'm giving more of the traditional rulers and I think for perfection, because it's a traditional technique, you might start or use first the traditional rulers and then add the modern rulers. Aries has Mars as its ruler. Taurus has Venus as its ruler. Gemini has Mercury as its ruler. Cancer has the moon as its ruler. Leo has the sun as its ruler. Virgo has Mercury as its ruler. Libra has Venus as its ruler. Scorpio has Mars again as its ruler. Sagittarius has Jupiter as its ruler. Capricorn has Saturn as its ruler. Aquarius has Saturn as its ruler again. And then finally, we have Pisces, which has Jupiter as its ruler. Again, there's a quiz at the end. You all will have to be sure that you have memorized that list. No, I'm kidding. Um, especially if this is completely new for you and I understand. But, you know, if you have a sense of your chart at all, then maybe some of that resonated in terms of what you have, like if you're a Pisces rising or a Gemini rising or a Cancer rising, you know, then there's a moon and Gemini rising has Mercury and Pisces rising will have Jupiter as the Lord of that year. Okay, let's explain this particular graph. This particular graph starts off with the ascendant and what you're paying attention to is in the center here. So this actually is the first house and this is the second house. Now you may say like, but why is it zero? Um, and when I do these voices, by the way, I'm not mocking or imitating any particular person. They just come, I don't know where they come from, just in my head. Um, so why why start there? Well, one- hey, Sam. Yes, ma'am. Question, do we use whole sign I'm houses? Get to that. For, okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question and anticipating the question. Yeah, that's a very good question, and I'm going to get to it. So, um, well, one, the Greeks didn't have zero, right? They technically didn't. And also think about it, your first year of life, we, we, also, we also talk about that in terms of months. We don't say zero. I'm zero years. We say instead, Oh, my baby's five months. No, I mean, we don't say anything. I mean, I, when I was six months, I didn't say, I'm six months. Well, I mean, I don't, I didn't. Um, maybe some other people have, but that's kind of the thing why we have zero. So this is zero. And then you go around. So your first year of life is going to be you being in what we call a second house perfection. So if your Aries rising, Taurus is going to be 
your temporary ascendant for the year, and Venus is going to be the Lord for that year, which I'll better explain and go more into, but you get the idea, I hope. If not, hit me with the questions. That's fine. It's more important that you get this particular part than almost anything else. Then, so you go at one, two, three, all the way around to the 11th house. Then you see on this outer circle here, it goes to 12. So your 12th year of life, when you turn 12 years old, begins your first house perfection year, which then that highlights, as you see, 12, 24, 36, 48, 72, all the way all over. That is talking about, you know, we could look at perfections by a factor of 12. So first house perfection is always going to be some division or di of 12. Uh, so when you're 48, first house perfection year. 24, first house perfection year. Similarly, it's going to be true, but it's not as easily divisible by 12. So when you're in your second house perfection year, you'll be 13, 25, 37, 49. So if I said, you know, 45, then what you would do is you could see here, and what confuses people, they look at the ninth and think it's the ninth house. It's not. You have to start from this inner circle here and go up. It's going to be 45. So when you're 45 years old or turn 45, you're going to be in what we call 10th house perfection year. Whatever you have on the cusp of your 10th house, um, and we'll talk about the house issue in a second, uh, is going to be more so the sign that gives us the ruler for your year, your temporary ascendant. I see something in the chat. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, so, so the first house perfection year is our natal ascendant. That is correct. That is going to be, so the Lord of your first year of life, when you're only measured in months, is going to be the ruler of your ascendant. Now, one thing that may be important for those who are unfamiliar with this concept What's more emphasized in the classical mindset are planets. What's more emphasized in the modern mindset are signs. So you think, oh, I'm in, let's say, a Gemini. I'm a Gemini rising, let's say. I'm in a Gemini year. And then you start thinking about all your associations related to Gemini. Throw that out your mind. You, you know, you guys, some of you are used to me, so I'm going to be a little rude. Nobody cares. It's Mercury. So you're going to have to look where your Mercury is in your chart, and that will give you more information. It is not so much sign derived. Signs exist in this world, in this view, to tell me where the ruler is and who the that's, ruler is. That's beautiful. I, I love it. I have another question for you. Uh, so if someone is 48, which is a first house perfection year, do we look at topics of both first house and seventh year topics? Woo! Someone's advanced. Yes, <laughs> that is true. But I'm going to get to that because I look at houses reflexively. So you have to look also between first, but first start off. It's like when you bake a cake or you're making something. I don't want you simultaneously to look at the seventh house. Look at the first house, the significations related to the first house, and then we'll talk about other things we look at, including the seventh house, the reflexive house. So that means second house, you're going to look at the eighth. Um, third house, you're going to look at the ninth. Fourth house, you're going to look at the tenth. And fifth house, you're going to look at the, the eleventh. And then sixth house, you're going to look at the twelfth as well. But that's more dynamic. I want to show you another chart because some have told me that this um, is more informative or helps them. And when I first saw this chart, and this is also courtesy of Chris Brennan, for all my charts, I give credit to where credit's due. This is also from Chris Brennan, as you can see. This is from Charlie Obert, who's one of the teachers, I believe, at Kepler College. Then there's uh, also this from Chris Brennan. So this uh, other chart, if you're a Pisces rising, then you could see year one, you're in your first house perfection year, and you're dealing with Jupiter or Pisces. Then um, when you turn one, you're in a second house perfection year, so you're going to be dealing with Aries, and then so forth through the years. 
If you were a Gemini rising using the example I have, this is the listing that you would go through from your for your first 36 years of life. And then again, also covers until you're 72. And you know, if you got it until you got 108, you got that too in terms of listing this. So some people find this helpful. Um, so I wanted to supply this as well, but it's the same kind of idea going by rising sign. Sorry. All right. Here's a summary to make sure that we're on the same page so far. Each year, and I see some things in the chat. Um, yeah, do you, uh, if we... Yeah, if you're we talking have, about yeah. inter, your quadrant houses, which we'll get to. <laughs> yeah, quadrant houses are when we're talking about other than whole sign houses. So I'm going to get to quadrant houses. So I will answer that question because I know that's something that frequently comes up. Okay. Each year, the cusp of house becomes a temporary ascendant for that year of life. So your second house cusp is the temporary ascendant for when you, you turn a particular year. The topics of that house will be a key theme for that person's year, meaning it's more, again, not so much about the sign as much as the topics related to the house. Then attention is given to the planet that rules the house for that year. So if, again, you're Gemini rising, and let's say you're in a third house perfection year, which means that you are 26 years old, let's say, then you may be dealing with, um, for that particular year as a Gemini rising, you're gonna be dealing with the ruler of the sun. You're gonna be dealing with Leo. And so you're gonna be dealing with the sun. So that would give us some sense. Well, one of the topics, third house topics. So let me go back. Siblings, immediate neighbors, environment, day-to-day -day associates, short journeys, communication, writing, learning, religion, spirituality, education. Those particular things may be important. And then we see where the sun is, and that will influence or give us more additional information about how you might deal with those topics. So if it's in the eighth house, it may cost you a good measure of money in order to say, like, let's say education or your trips. Or it may be that, um, you know, there's various significations that you can draw in. I mentioned death, loss, again, debt. Um, it may be that a partner supports you as you're pursuing some measure of your travel communication, or you're giving more money, lending more money, let's say to a sibling from that particular point of view. Because remember, third house relates to those topics, eighth house relates to death, debt, loss, uh, fears, concerns, other people's money and resources. Then the next thing we do is also look at the essential dignity, which means the sign that the planet is in and whether that's a place that feels like it belongs. Again, that's a broader topic. Um, so for instance, Saturn's in Aquarius right now. That is one of his homes. So Saturn, as I mentioned earlier, rules Aquarius. So it's considered a domicile. So that means he's in his essential dignity. Um, whereas Venus, Venus is also in Libra right now. So Venus is also in her essential dignity. A few weeks ago, she was in Virgo. So she was in one of the places that's considered her fall. So essential dignity comes in the mix. Accidental dignity is a little more advanced and that's also related to where the planet happens to fall in the chart, and then what aspects uh, that planet connects to. That gives us all the flavors and different dynamics related to the year. Hey, Sam, we have a uh, question here. What if a planet is neither in exaltation, detriment, or fall? Do you also look at the transiting Time Lord and its dignity too? It Absolutely. looks like we're going to get to that, uh, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask. <laughs> yes, so that actually goes along with what I was just about to say. Um, the planet's transits, stations, and aspects to the temporary ascendant will hold prominence that year too. So for instance, if you are in a Mercury ruled year, meaning let's say you have a uh, cancer on the cusp of the first house, and then we're talking about the third house again, which is going to be Virgo. All the Mercury retrogrades and stations for that particular year that you're in a Mercury-ruled year, 
are going to be very important for you. So they give us a lot more information about how you're dealing with managing that particular year. If you are in a lunar year, meaning that it's ruled by the moon, then all the things, the lunations, mainly the new moon and full moon and definitely the eclipses may have extra significance, especially if they hit by degrees particular parts of your chart. Similarly for the sun, and so if you're in a solar perfection year, but definitely for all the planets. So for instance, if you're in a Jupiter perfection year, meaning that we're dealing with that particular year where you have Pisces or Sagittarius as your temporary ascendant, when Jupiter retrogrades or has its station, that's where it also may be very important for you in terms of significant events or the likelihood of things related to the themes for that year are prominent. Okay, let me move forward. You can perfect from the ascendant, which is mainly what we've been talking about, but you can do it from the midheaven. You can do it from the sun. You could do it from the moon. You can move it from the lot of fortune or the part of fortune. Now, I mainly perfect from the ascendant. Um, and then we're also going to talk about uh, monthly perfections where you also can advance your chart and get monthly perfections, I will show you how to do it. Although the technique is ideal for whole sign houses, because it's easier. I don't, when I say ideal, I don't mean then like, oh, it, it sucks to do it with Placidus, or it sucks to do it with any other house system. That's not what I mean. It's just easier to do, because you only have to deal with one house. As someone asked, well, what about if you have an interception, or you have two, two signs in one house? I will talk about that in just two slides in terms of how you deal with that. It's a very simple solution. I do wanna say, because I realized that there may be different kinds of people in this particular lecture, um, that you also can perfect just from your sun sign. So if you don't know, and this may not be as rigorous, it may not be as exacting, it may not be as accurate as when we have a time, but you can perfect from your sun and putting that as your ascendant if you don't know your birth time. So let's say for the sake of argument, oh, you know, I was, I'm was i just a Gemini. As, you know, my son is in Gemini. I know what time I was born, where the planets are, but I don't know the actual time. What we can do is put your son in Gemini at what we call the ascendant. You know, Gemini is the ascendant and perfect from there. So I mentioned the sixth house perfection would find at the cusp of that, Scorpio. Now, again, where you might say like, but you know, what if I'm not born at that time? That's true, but we don't have a time until someone either rectifies your chart, which is a process by which an astrologer figures out what is your likely time of birth or what matches your particular time of birth, or you find your time somehow, either by getting a long form, if they put it on there, uh, put your birth time on there, or if you find some um, something from a particular parent or family member that also mentions your time. Sometimes it's a, a birth announcement, any particular thing. Until that, then this is what you can do. I, and I actually have found that it still works and you find resonance with this particular technique. Hey, Sam, we have a, a few questions, but I want to make sure you can, uh, you can keep going. You're on such a great role. Are you okay with a, with a, a few questions? I can see keep... Yes, go ahead. Okay. So for the accidental dignity, are you saying um, for houses as counted from the perfected year? Excellent question from the natal chart. Great. Okay. Uh, so if we are in a Mercury year and Mercury is placed in Libra, would both Virgo and Gemini houses become activated as well as Libra? Three houses active for that year. Make sure I'm understanding. Natal. <laughs> yeah, it seems like what they they're they're asking. I think there's some confusion about the signs versus the planet rulership. So what they're asking is, okay, well, if I have Mercury and Libra or um, any anything for that matter, would 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 both Mercury houses plus the Venus house be activated because it's in Libra? I don't know. I think that's. That's what they're saying. And Amanda, if- Yeah, I think to, to keep it simple, because it is a very simple technique, it is more so um, 
you know, it, it's more about the houses that we're dealing with. So if you're in yeah. a Gemini perfection year, Mercury is the Lord. If Mercury is in Gemini, then Mercury is in the house next to Virgo, right? You don't even have to worry about Gemini. It just will, it will just be kind of con convoluted. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. That's, that's pretty simple and um, understandable. So the next question, what about the sun or moon as a temporary ascendant since they don't go retrograde? Uh, but they have lunations. They have eclipses. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about retrograde. They, Perfect. They're there. Okay, so here's the issue. And I'm using Nikola Tesla's chart. And um, just because I find his chart fascinating in his life, so I'm not going to get so much into it now. But let's say I wanted to look at his 17th year of life. Because something big did happen in his 17th year of life. He got very sick, almost died. Long story, very short. He ended up getting what he wanted, which was to go to university to study because his father wasn't going to let him study engineering. He was going to have to study religion. So he did get what he want. And just to kind of make clear, I'm using whole sign first. We're going to start from 12. This is his 12th year of life, right? Remember, that's the first house because we can go by divisions of 12 or um, factors of 12. So 12, 13 for his second house, 14 for his third house, 15, for his fourth house, 16, for his fifth house. And then 17 becomes this particular house, the this, this sixth house. So that's where we face, or he faces his moon, his Mars. And the sixth house, as one of the particular themes and issues that come up with, are related to health. And he has Mars conjoined to moon during his 17th year of life. He contracted cholera, right, in terms of something related to heat in his body and getting sick. He was feverish, almost died. Now, we can do the same thing with Placidus, but here's the trick. The trick is do not count by the houses. You must count by the signs. So what are we gonna do? And this changes things some, but I don't think it messes up things completely. So how do you do it? So we would count Taurus as 12. Gemini is 13, right? Then Cancer as 14. Then Leo as 15. And then we would count, um, you know, Virgo as 16. Now notice that Virgo is on the cusp of his sixth house. And then as 17, Libra. Now, this changes things. The perfection Lord is still going to be Venus. But you have an additional thing you could look at, which is Mercury, because all those planets end up in the sixth house. How do you deal with that? That's a lot to kind of keep up with. Well, I would say this is where you have to learn to stack things. Priority will be given to the actual Lord, which is Venus. Then you can give to the house Lord, Mercury, as for additional information. I still think you don't lose anything. You might say like, well, I gain more. I gain extra information from Mercury. Yes, but that's also an extra step, which may give you extra information. There's a risk of also confusing you, um, but you won't have to worry about that as much if you're focused on this particular cluster here of looking at Libra because you're counting by signs. You're not counting by houses because what may happen is then you may just arrive as Virgo as the Lord or even something, some, I've seen some people go to Scorpio. So it's best just to count the signs. The other issue that you run into as versus whole sign houses versus quadrant base houses, quadrant base houses are like Placidus, um, Regiomontanus, Alcavicius, um, Porphyry, uh, where we divide the chart into quadrants. So one thing you have is that you will have the midheaven as always the cusp of the 10th house using a quadrant-based system. When you have whole sign houses, you can have the midheaven in the ninth house, in the eighth house, in the 10th house, in the 11th house, 
even the 12th house. So what the midheaven by virtue of moving, how you would interpret that. So let's say you're in a ninth house perfection year, as you see with Nikola Tesla, um, rather than in the 10th house, the midheaven is more so about your calling, your vocation. It's not just about your job. It, what, it's more significant to your life's work. The analogy I like to give is imagine that you have someone in your neighborhood who seems to always draw, draw the kids, almost like a mother goose figure who's feeding them, mother hen figure um, who feeds the kids, uh, loves to hang out with them. They love to hang out with her. They give her candy. He gives, she gives them candy um, you know, during the holidays. She's just an overall sweet, supportive person. And that is how she is known. That is her reputation. In other words, that is her midheaven. What's her job? She works at Arthur Anderson, or now it's called Anderson Consulting, I think. And no one ever knows, right, that that was her job. That's her 10th house. That's where she works. But her calling, vocation, what's, what's likely going to be written on her obituary, that's what we're talking with the MC. So we could be talking about his MC, Nikola Tesla, related to Saturnian themes, because Saturn is the ruler for his MC. And that colors some way in which his calling is going to be more ninth house related, which means being in another country, which was true. He was born in Croatia, but he has his most greatest prosperity in North America between Canada and also in the United States. Okay. I hope that clarifies the question that was asked earlier. So basically- yeah, I think so. Oh, Sorry. you're asking, you're reading the question? Yeah, I'm so used okay. to Okay. Yeah. yeah, I can tell. <laughs> so basically you use whole signs to count years, but you can apply the sign rulership to the themes as defined by Placidus. You can apply the ruler of that house as an additional testimony. Maybe that's the better word an additional testimony since, you know, that cluster of planets that we're talking about for that sixth house perfection, that is actually cussed by Mercury instead of Venus in the whole sign system. So I guess that's a roundabout way of, yes, that's the answer. Okay, let's move forward. This is just the same thing. I just wanted to use bigger slides. Um, in terms of the difference in, in case that wasn't clear. So I want to get into some finer points in terms of really highlighting, this is what I'm calling the considerations for perfections, highlighting what are you looking at when you start doing perfections. Now, again, um, this is going to be a little more advanced because, I mean, some things may not be as clear that you may not be familiar with, but I'm going to try my best in terms of keeping it simple. The elemental focus of the perfected ascendant and its relationship to the natal ascendant. So, for instance, if you are uh, a Pisces rising, the water elements of the fifth house perfection, the ninth house perfection, will have an easy sense of flow in relation to the ascendant. Conversely, you may also experience a sense of flow during a fifth house perfection year where you have cancer on the cusp of the fifth house using whole signs um, as a flow between themes related to the ninth house or let's say the first house, your actual ascendant. One thing, when I say there's a temporary ascendant, I don't want you to ever think that the temporary ascendant somehow removes the need to acknowledge your actual ascendant. There's a dialogue that happens. So that's why I'm mentioning the element of focus of the perfected ascendant with the actual ascendant the natal ascendant. Angular houses, first, fourth, seventh, and 10th house are still most important. When you have a perfection of one of those angles, they will be significant years because angles are like the best seats in the house. It's where the star can see you, let's say if you're going to a rock concert or a play and you can see the star clearly. You know, I'm talking about literally, not the stars in the heaven, but let's say, you know, I'm, I'm going to see, um, 
I don't know, Drake. I don't know why he popped in my head. He just popped in my head. So Drake and Drake can see me on his stage and I can see him, right? As, you know, whatever. Um, if the rule of a perfected house is at an angle, it magnifies its importance. So let's say, again, angles, you know, put you in a position to be visible um, or the planet to be visible. If you're in a third house perfection year and Capricorn is on the cusp of your third house and your Saturn, let's say, is in Taurus, that's an important year. Why? Because Saturn's in your seventh house and that means he's going to be very visible um, in your life and Saturnian themes related to it. Angularity gives singularity. It gives a level of presence and um, influence in your life, signifying what themes and issues you may be contending with. The tenants of a house will add greater significance to the themes and issues, just like when you're a tenant in, like if you rent um, and you're a tenant in a house, like I'm renting this home, you know, landlord owns the home. He's the lord of this year every year or the lord of this house every every year. But the the key thing is what I do in here, I'm largely going to be also determining some measure of that. So tenants in a house, like let's say that third house example, are also going to be instrumental in dealing with the themes. Going along also with the question that was asked about first and seventh, no house of perfection works in isolation. The opposite house is in play at well, as well. Um, here are some more considerations that are not as big as the other ones I've talked about so far, but they're still important to at least mention. Planets in essential dignity find it easier to express their natures as rulers or tenants. The planets that may be in detriment may have more difficulty. That doesn't mean, again, because some people start thinking the worst, a Saturn in Cancer as your ruler for that year doesn't mean then Saturn's going to just jack you up and mess you up and you won't have a good life or a good year. What the word I like to use for these particular kinds of planets, they complicate things. And a complication doesn't mean then that you can't do the thing that you want to do or you won't accomplish some of the things you want to accomplish. So for instance, maybe you have trouble logging in to something like this from your computer. But that doesn't mean that you can't get on your phone and be more successful. You still can get into like the webinar. You will find a way. It complicated your situation, but that doesn't mean it thwarts your situation. Planets in challenging houses, the natal 6th, 8th, and 12th, as well as the rulers and tenants there will complicate the themes related to that year. Um, so I can give some illustrations of that a little later, especially with one example. The same is true for when planets that rule those houses and where they end up, like Saturn ruling the 12th, but he's in the second. So again, he's ruling a, a house that has that aversion. So even if he's in the second, he's going to be drawing in the issues related to money and trying to deal with 12th house themes, you know, things related to seclusion, themes dealing with self-undoing. Ways in which you get in your own way, sabotaging your own efforts. So the first example I'd like to share with you is Richard Branson. Um, I know he's not the most popular dude, but it's interesting circumstances in this chart for what happened. And we're looking at his 61st year of life. So in the Q&A, with a mad rush, if we're talking about his 61st year of life, what house are we talking about? Cue Jeopardy music. All right. Two. Second. Saturn. Second house. All right. Kathy gets it. Second. Nara. Uh, All right. Yeah. So Carolina, you're you're right. I mean, Saturn's there, but we're talking mainly about the second. Got it. Excellent work. So who is the ruler of his second house? Also, put in the Q&A as fast as you can. Go, go, go. Mercury, Mercury, Mercury. Julia, C, C, yeah. <laughs> Mercury. 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 I got it. Dahlia's like, shut up. Um, all right. Yes, Mercury. So 
what gives us information? So he's going to be dealing with the themes related to money, possessions, um, you know, in terms of movable resources, um, ideally, but also it could be just his possessions in general. And then we could see by the tenants, this, you know, I'll come to Mercury in a second. The moon is there. Now, one of the things to understand about the moon, we think about emotions, but classically the moon also related to the body. It related to domesticity, the sense of home. It related to mother. Um, so its significations were a little broader. It also relates to some measure of the concrete mind. And then Saturn's there as well as a lot of fortune. So dealing with some measure of his money and resources are going to be highlighted. What does Mercury tell us? Well, Mercury is in Leo. And Mercury in that particular position, um, there's a couple things to know about, about, about that position. He's in the first house. What does that tell us? being in the first house. Forget for a second the themes related to the first house, but what kind of house is the first house? I told you there are four of them. It's angular, thank you. Yes. Angular. Yeah, and no Alani, no Alani thank you. Um, you mentioned, yes, it rejoices in the first. So it's someplace where it rejoices, it's angular. So by virtue of being angular, it's going to be seen this is something that may have some measure of prominence in his life as an issue. It's not something that may be easily swept under the rug. So it's going to have some measure of prominence related to some things in his life. Then we start looking at aspects of that Mercury. And Mercury doesn't really connect to much um, in this chart. You know, it doesn't have any other strong aspects. It has a wide trine, or not even wide trine, it has a trine to the north node in Aries, so maybe it draws in some ninth house topics related to like his travel or whatever. Um, it is in his first house, so that's another point of significance. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I point out. But here's, here's the, the key thing. It's peregrine, meaning that it doesn't have any exact essential dignity in that degree, in that sign. A peregrine, a peregrine planet is like a vagabond. It literally is kind of like, well, I don't have to really do anything that you say. Um, it kind of seems more so um, a loose cannon, more along its own trajectory. And it's unaspected, which means it's feral, meaning it, it's kind of like not tethered to anything. So this can be dealing with some reckless issues or some unpredictable issues related to his possessions during his second house year. Dara, I see that your hand is raised, so just give me a second. Let me finish this exposition, and then we'll talk about it. One last thing I wanted to point out to you. Remember I told you tenants are important when we're looking at that particular year? Notice that the moon is opposite to Jupiter. What do you think that might signify? Excess. Excess. What else? Thank you, Dahlia. No one else? Come on. <laughs> we raise By the way, for those who are raising your hand, please uh, put your question in the Q&A. Uh, mm -hmm. Money, lots, loss of values. It's in the benefic of sect. Since yeah. Mercury is in Leo, uh, would you also consider the Mercury is ruled by the sun in perfection? Yeah, Mercury is ruled by the sun in the 12th house. So that's something you would, additional strain that you could put through. A lot of um, emotional ups and downs. That, so it can be, remember, Jupiter is in an aspect in a house of loss. So it may be some, not just emotional up and downs. Remember, that is the modern impulse to think about the emotions. You know, like it wasn't very, it wasn't a, a key important issue for um, our predecessors, you know, say the Greeks and the medieval periods, kind of like, you know, just suck it up. <laughs> they didn't deal as much with emotional issues. But moon opposite Jupiter, which signifies some measure of trouble related to debt, related to excesses, related to even some dimensions of loss. So Dara, you've had your hand raised. What is your question? Oh, uh, Dara mentioned that they had some technical difficulties and to ignore the hand. And interestingly, I cannot lower their hand. So okay. I don't know. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 
So okay. thanks for sure paying attention. Yeah, that was great. Okay. So what happened? In 2011, when he was 61 years old, literally a month after his 61st birthday, there was a massive fire um, in his one of his properties, his house on Nucker Island, which is in the Bahamas. He was hosting his mother, Moon, as well as Kate Winslet, the Kate Winslet, I mean, like this is Richard Branson, while he actually stayed in a guest house with his wife, but he actually ran out of his house, buck naked, as we say, and tried to, you know, he was trying to get his mama, you know, and trying to help and, and salvage his family. The story ends well because Kate Winslet actually ends up carrying um, his mother on her back and getting her out the house. No lives were lost, but his house burned to the ground, it was completely flattened. Wow. Someone, someone actually asked a question. Um, that's an amazing story, though. Wow. Um, moon, okay. Yeah. Wait, it gets better. Would Moon... Okay. Um, Opposite Jupiter events be most prevalent in the first or and or seven months. We're going to get to that, but the short answer is yes, because we're talking about monthly perfections. So excellent question, but I hope to get to that. I do have a question. Um, how much more time do I have? Well, we are at uh, 36, so we have about, um, let's do the math here. Is that... Um... Do I have like 24 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> 24 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And are you guys rigid about that? Uh, uh we'd like oh, we'd like to end at the time, but we'll allow you to go over if you need for the presentation. Probably okay. If you give me a little more time over that. So yes, because I just want to make sure I get, you know, with the allowance of QA, but I can actually speed through some things. So hey, I just wanted to, sorry, I, this is Donna. I'm just gonna jump in and say we are at now three hundred and ten dollars for donations. So Oh, yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you, everyone. All right. I, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I definitely will take a break to also encourage people to, you know, this was free with donation. So I would encourage people, when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about the broad range of people like me, um, like Omari, like some other people who are attending here, like Janelle who just kind of chimed in. Um, other people who represent the diversity within our community. And I don't mean just like in terms of quote unquote ethnic or racial diversity, but sexual diversity, um, whether you're queer, you're trans, you're non-binary, all the different ways by which we can represent our humanity. This becomes important in not just representation, but being able to articulate your voice and perspective in how astrology grows, right? Let's just be frank for a second. You know, most of the books that we see on our shelves that you see lined on my shelves have been written by white men. And the only way that's going to change in terms of seeing the broad range of genders and people who are going to be on those bookshelves, say 40 years from now or your bookshelves is by moments like that where we can have scholarships for people to have quality education whether it's a Kepler or IAA or anywhere else to be able to, to know astrology. So please contribute. Thank you so much, Sam. And I also, I, yeah, that intersectionality of it all is so important and uh, we need more voices. Um, and I also want to mention that for, if, if we get to that thousand dollar number, we can actually host um, an entire full scholarship because Kepler matches the donation. So uh, I just wanted to mention that as Thanks. well. Yeah. All right. So let me answer Janelle or chime in. So yes, Kate would be that Venus in the, you know, ruled by that Mercury as well in the 11th house. I actually think in terms of no life, the, no loss of life is also that Jupiter in his domicile. Um, so I think that is also something that's immensely helpful. So here's the kicker. I mentioned that during his second house perfection when he was 61 years old, that this happened. Six years later, when he's 67, that we moved to an eighth house perfection. 
the dynamic again between Jupiter and the moon. What happened? Then it became a hurricane that swoops through Necker Island again, levels his house to the ground and everything else on the island, but no loss of life. Jupiter was again a saving grace. And that was in 2017. So when I say that these work in terms of a pair or reflexively, reflexively, that's literally what I'm talking about. So what we can advise is that when he comes to that second house perfection again, he better up his insurance as an example. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, well, maybe I can come back to Regina King. I, I, I use, I can start off, this is just for her 12th house perfection year. I like to use the 12th house perfection year as an example, um, and we won't do the full delineation. Um, but one thing I'll say, a lot of people think doom and gloom related to the 12th house perfection year. Like, it's going to be a hard year. It's 23, like she was 47. Now, she won the Academy Award when she was 47 years old. And she had also won, I think, the Oscar, the pre not the Oscar, the um, Emmy the previous year. But what's significant about her getting that at... Um, Okay, I'll answer your question in a minute, Carla. What's significant about her doing it in a 12th house perfection year is the 12th house I call the padded room. That's one of my nicknames that my students probably are very familiar with. But what does that mean? Now, you might think the worst, like, oh, that means like you're locked up in the asylum and you have, you're wearing a straight jacket and that's with the padded room. And that's sometimes an association that's given to the 12th house. But the padded room is also a studio. It's any particular place where you insulate yourself in order for a dedicated purpose. It can be where you set yourself apart in with a, a certain level of intention, whether it's a sound studio or a recording studio or a film studio, or even just a room like this, where you do the work and the dedication related to making something happen, which is one of the reasons why Saturn also rejoices in the 12th house. So what I would say is that she actually did the work, um, you know, going back to her chart for a second. Here we go. Um, being in a 12th house perfection year, notice that her Saturn is angular. It does widely oppose her midheaven. Now I do not know what was happening in Regina King's domestic life. So, you know, it's like something could have happened. But she's a pretty private person, especially as Aquarius rising. I'm not surprised. But so I, I couldn't find any scoop, any tea related to her life. And I don't know if I would sensationalize it. But her level of prominence in terms of what she achieved during that year. And Regina King, just for those who are not familiar with her, she is a notable actress. Um, and she's been in the game. You know, she was 47 um, I think in 2018, even before that, at least 20 years before, maybe even 30 years before, because she was a child actor and she was on 227, um, which was a series on, on television. I forget which station or which network now. So she had been in the game for a long time before she actually got that Oscar, the sweetness of that Oscar. So that's also Saturn. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, do you read perfections only against the natal chart or do you combine it with the solar return? I personally teach and use it in relation to the solar return, but there's only so much I can do in 90 minutes. But yes, that is actually one of the techniques that was employed in relation to using the perfection. Now you can do it from our part of fortune. So how do you do that? And then I also talk, we'll talk about what is the part of fortune because one thing I need to debunk pretty quickly the part of fortune, the lot of fortune, which is the same thing, is not about where you were lucky or where you're lucky. Not in the sense that you might understand. It's more so the vortex where you experience your lot in life. And I like to say vortex because it's where things kind of come in your orbit, whether that's quote unquote good or whether that's quote unquote bad. It is just the nature of it. And I think how something becomes good or bad depends on how you position yourself and some measure of your attitude. You know, 
So you might look at her chart and see the lot of fortune is conjoined to the moon and Pluto have, dealing with very intense emotions. Well, her early career has been late, uh, was mainly about comedy and different things, but I'm sure that was probably annoying for her because she wants to deal with some measure of depth. And so her later uh, characters and that she plays or even kind of comes to create have been a lot more intense, um, a lot more quote unquote Plutonian and drawing in with some of the deeper, richer aspects of it. Um, I don't use them with progress charts. You can use the progress chart as testimony related to whether it affirms or complicates or deals differently with what the perfection says, or even how you might tie in with um, the um, solar return chart. Uh, so quickly, 47th year of life from using this as the ascendant, we we'll put it in the seventh house. That's an angular house. We look to the sun. Now, natally, the sun is in the 12th house. So again, we kind of come back to a theme, interestingly enough. And just in case no one's clear, this is now the new, if we're perfecting from the lot of fortune, this is the first house. So this would be, you know, if we're going to count, this would be 48. But remember, she's 47. So we go back a year as the 12th house here. And so the sun would be the Lord of the year. And so that takes us to the 12th. Now, what's interesting, if we're counting from the lot of fortune, this actually ends up being the fifth. So this gives us, and in case that's not clear, because I understand that this is a new way of counting, one, two, three, four, five. So this is the fifth from the lot of fortune. So creative endeavors really gives her a leg up of where she might experience, you know, events, powerful events that can happen for her. Notice how I use that phrase, powerful events, as versus saying, this is her luck. Because one of the things I'll say to you, again, and this is just from different things, the lot of fortune, and you can read all of this, um, is more so about how we coalesce between the two lights, darkness and light, more so related to your body and your physical incarnation. So it becomes even about what we could say dumb luck and dumb luck doesn't always have to be lucky, right? It could be like where you draw your lot in life. It could be you, the one that has to go into the cave, whatever that might mean for you. Or it may be your lot um, where you're dealing with a particular issue that someone else may not have to have dealt with five minutes before you. Um, so it isn't always about prosperity as much as the significations for how you may deal with some circumstances that work for you or against you, but are definitely within your orbit. You may even say where it's kind of like some dimension of fate. A lot of spirit is much more about your will, more about where you direct your level of intention. A lot of fortune is kind of as things so happen to you. So if you're more concerned about, you know, what other kind of things might affect your health, because the lot of fortune is also another way by which you can look at your health, you might also perfect from your lot of fortune. Um, and again, it kind of works the same way. So if you say, uh, if you're 53, you would count from the sixth sign, the sixth place, from your lot of fortune, wherever that may take you. So that's likely gonna be the first house. If it's, you know, in, in Regina's case, if we're talking about from the eighth, um, if we're talking about from the ninth, then it's gonna be the second house and some things that you may deal with. There's a question. Well, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat that I probably need. Oh, there's no questions in the chat. Um, there's a, there's a larger question that I addressed in the beginning that I'm going to touch on now, that your life does not go on repeat. It rhymes. But the longer answer is why each year, each 12 years, it may be different, is that the transits to the Lord of the year will be different each time. Transits by the Lord of the year to natal planets will be different. 
because it's likely going to be in a different sign, um, depending on what Lord it is. Transits through the perfected sign each year will be different. So in terms of what particular things get highlighted. When you study classic solar returns, you'll see how traditionally those returns uh, complement this time lord technique specifically. What I'll say is this. One weird thing is that often the perfection lord, if not the perfected house, is highlighted in the natal solar return, meaning the solar return in the natal location. So if you, and I've seen this with so many charts, that let's say you're in a third house perfection year. What may happen is that you may see that you end up, the third house is rising or the sign on the cusp of the horizon, the ascendant for your solar return. Or the Lord of that third house is very prominent or angular. It's, it's kind of creepy because there are two different techniques. Now, again, what helps flesh out what you're looking at, and I'm not going to get into solar returns now, um, it's the perfection lord, the lord of the year will tell you how it's faring, how things are going in your solar return. That's how you use them in tandem. Um, maybe I'll skip this. I just was going to say as an illustration, the difference between me during my 10th house perfection year and when I was 33 and then at 45. Now, some similar themes are going to come up um, because the ruler of my, this chart is probably better. I'm a Pisces rising. Um, and you have the midheaven here, Jupiter. You'll see on the outer wheel, Jupiter is in the seventh house. So what you can expect, um, or what I could have expected is that I would be dealing with 10th house issues, career vocation issues that also may tie in relationship issues. So in some way that also deals with my Jupiter. Now, remember what I said about Jupiter in or a planet in its detriment, it complicates things. It doesn't necessarily thwart it, especially if it's angular. So what happened? What I can say is that both times, both when I was 33 and 45, I went through a temporary breakup where my partner also ended up in another place or even another part of the world. And I also, when I was 33, that's when I kind of decided to take my career toward astrology after years of study. Also, when I was 45, that's when I became more of a well-known astrologer. I started writing for ebony.com. And I went through a breakup, then got back together, you know, 33. At 45, I got married. So there is a way in which there's a tandemness that is highlighted. Now, the solar returns, which again, we don't have time to evaluate, gives a little more nuance and information related to that. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm, I, I don't think I'm going to go over Bill Shoemaker's. He has an interesting, I'll just kind of do a spoiler alert and not go through the full example. Um, he was, we're going to look at him at 59 years old, his 12th house perfection year, ruled by Mercury. Mercury, as you can see, rules his midheaven. Mercury also trines his Saturn. Um, I'm getting fancy here using something called Antitia uh, or Contra Antitia. There's a connection, a secret connection between Mercury and Mars. What does that mean? If you're familiar with the idea of Antitia, it's really just the ways by which you know, if we're talking about from the solstices, from Cancer, Capricorn, um, we're talking about light and shadow. So the same amount of light from, the say, December 21st to, say, the first day of, of Capricorn is going to be similar to December 20th when it's at 29 degrees of Sagittarius. So what that means is that if we were to fan it all out going to Cancer, that certain signs are connected to each other, even conversely. Saturn, sorry, uh, Scorpio is connected to Aquarius, which means that it's also connected to Leo as the contra -antitia. Virgo is connected to Aries, but that means opposite point. It's also connected to Libra. So some Mercury-Mars issue may come up 
related to during this 12th house perfection year, and we're talking about 12th house, which relates to some aspect of one's undoing. What happened? You see, he's a jockey. He retired at 59, and he gets in his Ford Bronco car drunk, and, or at least, you know, what toxicology, or name toxicology, what was revealed later to be drunk. And he ends up in an accident and becomes a quadriplegic. Now, the story actually ends better. Um, he, uh, and maybe this is some measure of his strong mercury, even though he went through a very difficult time. He ends up writing a book, you know, in terms of, I guess, dictating it. And he also ends up also becoming a coach for the remainder of his life for aspiring jockeys even as a quadriplegic. So, but dealing with the 12th house issues and themes um, as highlighted by his Mercury, again, connected to his lot of fortune and he spent his life in a kind of mercurial profession, um, horse racing, you know, in terms of racing and dealing with what uh, mercurial folks um, messengers used to do, which is kind of race between places. So one thing I want to share with you is getting granular and looking at monthly perfections because there's another way in which you can you can do this rather than just looking at annual perfections. And then, believe it or not, we're nearly done. So I want to look at the chart of Tina Turner. And you can see that she's a Leo rising. And she was in her 36th year of life when she felt a massive transition that was at hand. And what I want to focus in on is I'm looking at, there's two ways you can do monthly perfections, which I'll come back to this slide in a second. Um, but this is her natal chart in the center here, which you saw before. And this is for July 1st, um, 1976. And why I did it for that specific date? Because I could have done it for, let's say, the time I did a session or something for her. But, you know, if I were, if she were a client. July 1st is the day that she left her abuser, Ike Turner. What's significant, now, there's a certain way in which the computer can calculate this for you, which will equate or mean you advance everything in your chart 2.5 degrees. And I'm going to show you a way that you can do this so that you don't have to count it up. There's a way that you can easily do it where you don't need to um, count it yourself, which I'll show in a second. Um, but you would everything kind of equates 2.5 degrees um, each month. That's one way to do monthly perfection. So that's what you're looking at. What's compelling is look at this. The day that she leaves him, Uranus is conjoined to the moon by perfection which would mean a sudden change um, in terms of that. Also, the ascendant is opposite to Mars because she got in a fight with him. He hit her as he was prone to do, and she waited until he went to sleep, and she just left the hotel where they were staying in, in Dallas because they were supposed to do a gig there, and she just left with her makeup bag. And it was a very hard thing, not just in terms of leaving him, but she didn't have anything else. And he wouldn't allow her to have access to anything else for years, including her children. And the only thing that he allowed her to have was her name. You know, his name, which was like Turner. And then he allowed her to keep uh, Tina Turner and, and performance. But he didn't allow her access to records, any other thing, um, you know, for that. You also see, there, see the Saturn is connecting to Uranus. So this becomes a very exacting way by which you can see in a perfection year, because remember, she was in the first house perfection year. It had per perfected from December of 1975 um, to five degrees 19, because everything advances 2.5 degrees um, in her chart, starting from 1724 Leo, and then you just would advance it until we got to July 1st. There's an easier way to do this, or a different way, I should say. You actually can perfect 
each house as representing a month. Now, what I mean by this, let's go to our natal chart so you're not distracted by anything else. If she's 36, her birthday is November 26, right? And this is for 1975. And you might ask like, well, um, why are we doing it from 1975, looking at her 36 year of life in July? Well, again, because we have to go to the previous year, right? So she's from this is sort of 1975. So this is going to be from November 26th, first house, to December 25, to the cusp of the second house. From December 26th, 30 days later, to we get to January 25 for the second house. Then January 26th to February. Then we can do February to March. March to April, April to May, May 26th to June 26th, or June 25th, I'm sorry, 7th house. And then June 26th to, um, to July 25th is going to be 8th house, dealing with loss, these particular things. You will notice then that we're dealing with Mars and Jupiter. So dealing with some aspects of loss, Perhaps like we saw some dimension of a fight during that particular time frame or month. And then for Jupiter, um, it would be tying in anything that relates to Jupiter by square, Jupiter square to Venus, dealing with relationship, um, dealing with love. And remember, it's a square, so it's very challenging. And then opposite to Neptune. So again, highlighting, highlighting loss where there might be some measure of a, again, a separation because it's an opposition. Um, What's interesting and even doubly important is Jupiter is the ruler of her son, which is actually their first house perfection year. So this is definitely something that would show up. Mars is also square to her, her son, which is the ruler of her overall perfection year or the Lord of the year. So this is on the scale of looking at, um, <laughs> watch out, Maria, I got something for you. And so let me just show you this because I anticipated all of you. So here's how you do it with software. If you have solar fire, you can go to chart, transit, progressions, directions, and then perfection annual. That's step two. If you have Sirius, you go to the P here, progression, and then perfection. Um, and then you can choose down here, annual, monthly, or even daily. And then... You can go to AstroSeek if you don't have software, astroseek.com, and then go to free horoscopes, traditional astrology calculator. Once you're there, you can go to annual perfections, and then it can give you a listing of how you can see not only the Lord of the year, but what's happening each month. And this is what Marlene, thank you, put in there. And it's also... Um, also, what um, someone else also mentioned, AstroSeek. So that I anticipate it because I know not everyone has software, and so you can do it online. The cool thing about AstroSeek, just like Astro.com, you can sign up like you see here. I put in, you know, my information, and then that is always just ready, you know, readily available for you. Um, I think someone asked me to repeat about monthly perfections, and what I was saying, there's two ways to do it. There's one way to count it by hand, which is actually what I do more so. Um, if you want to kind of get the sense of, okay, using my chart, starting from, I use 36 because that's pretty easy. We're starting from a first house perfection year. But let's say it's 40. I could start from here um, and let's say she was 40. And this is going to be true for November 20. Oh, sorry. November 20, I'll, I'll go to her natal chart. That might be easier. This is November 26th to December 25th. So this is going to be her first year of 40 and her first month. This is going to be the second month of her being 40. This is the third month, fourth month, and all the way around until you complete the year. And then next thing you know, you're in the sixth house perfection year. All right. I hope I've answered that question. Of, of course, Mariana. All right. 
with that said, and with five minutes over, uh, I'd like to thank you. This is how you can contact me. Um, unlockastrology at gmail.com, unlockastrology.com. I'm unlockastrology at Twitter and SF Reynolds on Instagram. I hope this has been helpful and that it's been practically, um, you know, practically perfect predictions that you can use using perfections. Uh, I find it as one of the more reliable techniques. Someone did ask me, like, what about what progressions and other things that you can do? Um, then what I would say, like with progressions, whether you're using tertiary, secondary progressions, I think of these multiple techniques as testimonies. And, you know, you kind of want to build them as a case, as an argument for what seems to be recurrent themes and issues. So, for instance, if you see that there's a Venus-Uranus conjunction in your solar return, you're in a seventh house perfection year, um, and then you see by progression that you're in a full moon, sun is opposite to moon from your first to the seventh house, um, then likely you are dealing with some relationship issues. And if you are single, it may be the welcoming of a new relationship. And if you are not, you're attached, it could be a change related to your, your relationship. 